As Andy announced, I uh, will be uh, presenting the case of Rwanda. I pre presented uh, a similar presentation here five years ago, and I was asked to um, present an, an update. With broad in the title, I refer to the fact that I will not only focus on the economic dimension, but I will also touch on the political spheres. As you know, the debate on Rwanda is uh, very polarized. There are scholars looking at the economics, and they are very positive. And then you have scholars looking at the politics, and they are very negative. I will look at a bit of both, and so there will be bits of uh, positives and bits of uh, negatives in my presentation. Now, regarding the update, this can, on the one hand, be taken quite literally. I will present uh, an update of the figures on poverty, growth, inequality, and governance indicators. But I will also try uh, to address some of the questions that I was unable to address uh, five years ago. And I think I can do so uh, thanks to uh, a new uh, data set. And so I'll, I will talk a bit about horizontal inequalities and about uh, political representation. And I will end my presentation with a cliffhanger in the form of a two-dimensional puzzle on Rwanda. So to make sure that you're all curious and Andy invites me back within these and five years to present some answers to that uh, puzzle. Um, the easy part, uh, growth backline is what I presented in uh, 2013. Uh, red line is what I uh, added for this presentation. You can see uh, a continued uh, pattern of uh, uh, growth. Rwanda is growing at uh, 4 to 5 percent annually, so actually 7 percent minus 2.5 uh, percent population growth, so 4 to 5 percent uh, per capita growth, and has landed in 2017 at the level of $1,900 uh, per capita. Looking at poverty, it all depends. Uh, it depends on what poverty line we are using. If we use the uh, national poverty line, um, then we see that across the two latest uh, integrated household surveys of 2010 and 2013, poverty declined uh, with uh, six uh, percentage uh, points. If instead we use the international uh, poverty line uh, of $1.9, uh, which is uh, uh, higher than the national uh, poverty line, we find that uh, poverty remained uh, constant almost uh, across that period. Now, this contrast, of course, between the numbers is a theoretical possibility because the international poverty line is higher than the uh, national poverty line. Nevertheless, I should mention that uh, the latest poverty uh, estimates based on the new poverty line, uh, new national poverty line, have been heavily criticized. And this uh, critique came following um, actually kind of a discovery that the poverty uh, line calculation drastically changed. So the method to calculate the poverty line drastically changed uh, uh, in the latest uh, survey of 2013. In the previous uh, surveys, including uh, the 2010 uh, survey, um, the poverty line calculation relied on uh, revealed preference uh, theory and so used the prevailing culinary habits of uh, poor on and households to construct the uh, food basket, minimum food basket. But in the latest uh, survey, um, the Iranian government uh, deviated from uh, the convention to use uh, revealed preference theory and set a poverty line uh, based uh, on uh, uh, cheap and high local highly caloric uh, food types. So they filled the food basket with uh, cheap and high uh, caloric uh, food types such as uh, cassava and uh, um, sorghum. And so as a result, the poverty line was set uh, much uh, lower and actually what you do when you use these two different uh, poverty line calculations, you're comparing the incomparable and basically overestimating overestimating the decrease in uh, poverty. This point was uh, first made by Philip uh, Reintjens in 2015 on uh, a block in uh, on African arguments. And the point was backed up um, 
later by a number of anonymous researchers in another uh, blog post. I'm not 100% sure who these anonymous researchers are, but I'm pretty sure they do not work at the White House. They um, constructed a set of comparable uh, poverty lines, and they show that using these, these various comparable uh, poverty lines to compare poverty uh, changes between 2010 and 2013-14, what you actually find is an increase in uh, poverty of around six uh, percentage points. So the discussion on this is ongoing. If you browse the internet, you will find many other uh, blog posts and calculations and uh, people playing around with uh, inflation um, uh, and so on. But to say the least, uh, the poverty uh, figures on Rwanda are uh, highly contested. A data set that is much less contested is uh, the one uh, based on uh, the DHS uh, numbers. And so here you clearly see that there has been continued progress in uh, the dimensions of asset wealth, uh, education, and health. In this table, I highlighted uh, the, the periods of progress in uh, green, and you, you see that also uh, in the, the, across the latter two, the, the latter period, so the updated figures, the progress is uh, continuing. Uh, for instance, uh, access to electricity more than doubled, maternal mortality more than halved. So here the picture is uh, uh, rather too very positive. The DHS data can also be used to check whether there is a, a convergence across uh, wealth quintiles uh, regarding health and education. So in this table, you see the ratio of uh, a couple of health and educational indicators between the top and bottom uh, asset quintiles. And so this ratio is uh, decreasing also in the, across the, the last two years, indicating that the difference between top and bottom quintiles is uh, becoming smaller, and so there is convergence in uh, human development. Uh, education and health uh, uh, improvements are uh, broadly uh, shared, and more and more so over time. So let me now move to uh, three important questions. Um, here they are in the order of less to more controversial. Let me start with the first one. Can the poverty statistics be reconciled with contrasting findings from qualitative fieldwork? There is a very large body of qualitative fieldwork on Rwanda that uh, is much more skeptical about economic development in Rwanda. Here's just one example, Ansons and Quarters, statistics versus livelihoods, questioning Rwanda's pathway out of poverty. These researchers find from their semi-structured focus group a much less rosy picture on economic development. And they try to explain the contrast with the conventional uh, growth and poverty statistics. And one of the reasons they put forward is that uh, because of social desirability, households actually um, over-report their production in the standard conventional service run by the government. Why would households do that? The authors of this paper refer to the culture of uh, performance uh, criteria and contracts in Rwanda and mention that there are uh, even cases of households signing performance contracts and committing themselves to reaching uh, a certain targets, uh, much in line uh, with the Imihigo contracts or performance contracts signed at the uh, different levels of uh, local government. I will not forcibly reject this uh, claim. It is theoretically possible, but the evidence for it is still thin, so I would still say that it's somewhat, somewhat speculative. Another possibility to explain the contrast between the conventional statistics and what emerges from qualitative fieldwork is that uh, subjective uh, and objective well-being measures uh, can both be right, but they measure very different things. Okay. Um, and so this is one of the arguments I made uh, five years ago, that subjective well-being measures may capture relative income rather than 
absolute income. Recently, I got the opportunity to work with a unique data set that includes an evaluative yet numerical measure of well-being uh, reported by Rwandan households. And this uh, data was collected by my colleague, Bert Ingelaren, who is an anthropologist. And he interviewed 412 Rwandan households in 2007 and in 2011. And the households were asked to tell their life history, which is a typical method of uh, anthropologists. But a bit atypical for an anthropologist was that Bert asked the households to systematically rank their uh, economic situation through time. So we have a, a, a ranking of economic situation uh, for each year of the life history of these uh, 412 uh, respondents. And so here I plotted this uh, ranking on, on a graph for the period 1990-2010. And so two uh, things are remarkable in this uh, graph. The first thing is that in a period of uh, a doubling of GDP per capita and uh, a decline of poverty with 20 percentage points, the rankings indicate an economic situation that is stable, flat. And secondly, the ranking according to the respondents of the life stories in the post-genocide uh, period is even lower than what they reported for the uh, pre-genocide period. So very sharp differences uh, compared to the uh, conventional uh, statistics, leading me to conclude that indeed these, these measures of well-being measure very different things. And so using the subjective measures to question the reliability of objective measures per se is probably not a good, good idea. Nevertheless, the subjective measures are valuable because they reveal something about what anthropologists like to call the lived experiences of people, and these are arguably very important. Should they receive more weight in the policy debate? Yes, but I think there's still a long way to go in order to uh, standardize their collection and validate them. So I don't think it's uh, for tomorrow. What is interesting also about the life history data set is that it is actually one of the only data sets uh, with uh, recent information in which also the uh, ethnic identity of the respondents is uh, known. So we can dig a bit into the question of horizontal inequality, although it's perceived horizontal inequality because it is uh, the economic situation as reported by the respondents themselves, their own ranking. Now, looking at horizontal inequality in Rwanda is, of course, important, uh, not only because of its history of ethnic violence, but also because uh, uh, the Tutsi minority dominates uh, the uh, high-level positions in government. This graph gives you the ethnic identity and gender of cabinet ministers throughout the period 1995-2015. And so you see that uh, Tutsi, who constitute 15%, 10 to 15% of the population, hold 60% of uh, uh, cabinet uh, positions, of high-level cabinet positions. Among those Tutsi are Tutsi returnees that dominate. Tutsi returnees count for about 5% of the Rwandan population. So there are some uh, concerns here and uh, therefore it's important to look at horizontal inequality. However, and maybe somewhat surprisingly or not, it all depends on what side you are in the Rwandan debate, um, when we look at the self-reported rankings of economic situation uh, of Hutu and Tutsi, we don't see a lot of difference. So we don't see evidence for perceived uh, increases in uh, horizontal inequality. We do see that Tutsi returnees um, rank their economic situation a bit better than Tutsi survivors, but the difference is uh, certainly not big. The trickiest question is left uh, for last. Can development in Rwanda be sustained if the country continues to score very low on voice and accountability? So there is, that should be severe, not several. There is widespread consensus among Rwandan scholars, scholars of Rwanda, that there is uh, severe societal and political repression in Rwanda. It is also reflected in a very low score uh, on voice uh, and accountability. Is this a problem? Will this prove the Achilles heel 
uh, of the Rwandan success story? Some scholars would say yes. For instance, Rentjens argues that the concentration of power that we see today, the power structures we see today, the governance style we see today, is very similar to the one that led to the genocide in the first place. Um, a political economy analysis a la Asemogla and Robinson will predict that growth will run out of steam because the elite will try to protect its economic interest and so will not allow for creative uh, destruction and innovation to take place. But equally bright scholars would say that it's not uh, a threat to economic development. They uh, categorize Rwanda in the box of uh, a developmental state where there is interference indeed of the elite in the economic sector, but rents are centralized and used uh, for broad-based and long-term uh, development. Who will turn out to be right? Your guess is as good as mine. But maybe our guesses can be better informed if we know what ordinary Rwandans think about their political representation. So back to the life history data in which respondents were also asked to rank their perception of political representation over time. So what do you expect? Flat, declining, increasing? Your guess uh, is not so good as mine now because I know <laughs> the data, but it's increasing over time. Okay, so since the genocide, we see a steady uh, increase uh, of uh, self-reported uh, uh, rankings in political representation by ordinary Rwandan peasants. You see that uh, the perceived political representation is markedly higher for Tutsi than for Hutu, and this is a reversal compared to the pre-genocide period when Hutu were in power. But the difference is actually um, re shrinking over time and not increasing. Uh, so if you see, compare, for instance, uh, 2000 uh, with 2011, you see a much uh, um, uh, smaller gap uh, in 2011. Political representation as perceived by uh, Tutsi survivors and return returnees is almost uh, similar. So here is the cliffhanger I promised. Two-dimensional puzzle on Rwanda. Conventional statistics say all is good on the economic front. Nothing is good, that's not true, but voice and accountability is flat on the political uh, front. Life history data also see this big contrast, but upside down. Economic situation is flat, political representation is uh, increasing. So there is still uh, a lot that we don't know about this puzzle. It indicates that reality experiences and, and perceptions are complex and we still have to do some additional research. We will probably not solve the entire puzzle, but in the life histories, there are lots of elements that can indicate some uh, useful directions uh, to, to start solving this puzzle. Every time a respondent changed its ranking over time in economic situation or in political representation, he or she was asked to explain uh, the reason why. And we have thousands of narratives in the data explaining a change in political representation, explaining a change in economic situation. And here, uh, I give you already a flavor of the narratives that we will start uh, analyzing in the coming months and years. These are um, narratives of change related to an increase in perceived political representation. I started being sure that the authorities would not kill me. There were no longer persons disappearing from the community. I was transferred from one prison to another. There we could find water to drink and wash ourselves. So clearly, the reference point is not a perfect liberal democracy, but the reference point is quite low, so it's not then uh, very difficult to go upward, but that's only one um, conclusion that we draw from the nar narratives. There are also many narratives that actually point to real improvements in accountability, although accountability that runs upwards, not downward, uh, and also real improvements in uh, service delivery. So more to come on this front in the coming months and years. We will be systematically coding and analyzing the nar these narratives and trying to solve this uh, two-dimensional uh, puzzle uh, on Rwanda. And I leave you with the conclusions, because I think the alarm will go off. <laughs> okay, so thank, thank you. You almost escaped the Tinbergen clock. <laughs> <laughs>